China, at the beginning of this century, shot to number one in the world in terms of transplant volumes after the United States, at 10,000 a year, according to the government of China figures. From where did all the organs come? The official Chinese explanation was donations. But China did not then have an organ donation system. In 2006, the government of China shifted uh, its explanation and said that the organs were coming mostly from prisoners sentenced to death and then executed. Well, how many prisoners were there in China being sentenced to death and then executed? The government of China would not say. Chinese hospitals' websites uh, advertised short waiting times for transplant tourists. Transplant tourists, patients going into China, whom we interviewed uh, after their transplantations, told us that they could choose their timing for transplants. That was true even for vital organs, heart, liver, and lung. Everywhere else in the world, patients waited months and years for organs. In China, hospitals and prisons waited for the arrival of patients so that prisoners could be killed for their organs. Now, not every prisoner is available as a source of organs for every patient. Transplants require blood type compatibility and ideally even tissue type compatibility. Organs of donors have to be at least roughly the same size as the organs that are being replaced. There's a high rate of hepatitis B in the Chinese criminal uh, prison population, in the order of 60%. That makes organs of many prisoners sentenced to death and then executed unusable for transplants. China at the time did not have an organ distribution system. That meant that organs were sourced locally from prisons in the neighborhood of the hospitals that did transplants. Chinese law requires pers persons sentenced to death to be executed within seven days of sentence. That means there was no pool of prisoners sentenced to death and waiting for patients to, be, uh, to arrive, to be executed. Put these factors together, and our estimate is that China, in order to get 10,000 organs for transplants a year, would have had to be executing in the order of 100,000 prisoners sentenced to death every year. That is an implausible figure, out by more than a factor of 10 than even the wildest death penalty estimates. Non-governmental organizations have estimated that China, at its height, was executing maybe 5,000 a year, which was already way more than any other country. Over time, death penalty volumes decreased, but transplant volumes with minor variations remained constant or even increased. So from where were all the organs coming? Donations were not the answer. Executed criminals were not the answer. What was the answer? Let's step back. Uh, let me begin with a, a confession. As a student in Paris in the late 60s, I was actually an admirer of Mao. Uh, I even read his little red book. He seemed, he seemed so kind swimming in the famous photo in the Yangtze River. Many historians today, as I'm sure you know, name Mao as one of the worst mass murderers of the 20th century. Chang and Halliday are Note that, quote, over 70 million perished under Mao's rule. Many governance problems in China today stem from the fusion of Mao's totalitarianism with Deng Xiaoping's economic reforms after 1978. But, ladies and gentlemen, violence and corruption are the system today in China. Every 10 years or so, the party starts a persecution of a minority and mainly, I think, to instill fear in the general population. Consider just three of the persecution campaigns that have gone on since 1950. The, uh, the so-called Great Leap Forward, where an estimated 40 million people starved to death. 
the uh, Cultural Revolution, which you all know, I'm sure, of 1966 to 76, saw perhaps another two million killed. The Tiananmen Square massacre of 1989, and that photograph, one of my favorite photographs of, of all time, uh, where soldiers killed thousands of people who were seeking openness and democracy. So what if David and I told you that hundreds of thousands of innocent people have been put into slave labor camps across China, where they're not only making goods for export, but they're also tortured, blood tested, and the unlucky ones are killed on demand for their organs, harvested for profit. So how did the two of us get involved in this? About 10 years ago, we were invited by a, a volunteer coalition to investigate allegations of, felon, of organ harvesting in China. Uh, I had been Secretary of State for Asia Pacific for Canada, and David Matus had had a lifetime of working on human rights and also trying to find lessons of the Holocaust. So we agreed on a volunteer, independent basis to look into these allegations. What follows, the conclusion of our investigative reform, our report, is so disturbing that we have called what's happening a new form of evil on the planet. That was our conclusion, that organs came from prisoners all right, but they were not only criminal prisoners sentenced to death and then executed, they were mostly prisoners of conscience, primarily practitioners of the spiritually based set of exercises, Falun Gong a Chinese equivalent uh, of yoga. Before the communist repression uh, of this practice, the number of Falun Gong practitioners was in the order of 70 to 100 million people, according to Government of China figures. That, they had been detained throughout China in the hundreds of thousands after the party decided to repress the practice out of jealousy over the popularity of Falun Gong and fear for the, by the party for its ideological supremacy. Falun Gong practitioners who recanted were released and some of those got out of China. We interviewed them around the world and found out that all Falun Gong detainees were systematically blood tested and organ examined. This was not done for their health since they were being tortured to recant but it is necessary for transplants because of the need for blood type and ideally tissue type compatibility. We had investigators calling into hospitals, pretending to be relatives of patients who needed transplants, and asking the hospitals if they had oral organs of Falun Gong practitioners for sale. Our callers claimed to want these organs because the organs were healthy, healthy because of the Falun Gong exercises. Throughout China, we got doctors and hospitals saying, yes, we do have organs of Falun Gong practitioners for sale, come on down. These calls have been taped, translated, and transcribed. Although the practice of Falun Gong is totally innocent, uh, the propaganda the party spewed out against practitioners demonized, depersonalized, and dehumanized this population. Their jailers thought nothing of killing them arbitrarily because they did not consider them human. This population provides an explanation for the numbers of transplants that prisoners sentenced to death and executed could not. When the persecution of Falun Gong began, the former head of the party, Jiang Zemin, vowed to, quote, ruin their reputation, bankrupt them financially, and destroy them physically. Falun Gong practitioners in China come from all walks of life, from scientists to soldiers to party officials. It's a grassroots spiritual movement, as was mentioned, that grew exponentially in the 1990s. So let's put some faces to the faceless. We'd like to show you a short excerpt from the award-winning film Free China, an Oscar contender for the 2014 for the best documentary that featured two inspirational survivors of the persecution. The main subject of the film, Jennifer, is a Falun Gong practitioner. She's a mother, 
She has a master's degree in science, and she's a former Communist Party member. After her escape from China, she became a best-selling author in writing about her experiences. Not only was she jailed and tortured, in her testimony she recounts how she was blood tested during her detention. Luckily for her, perhaps, she also had hepatitis during the birth of a child, and this perhaps saved her from being a so-called organ donor. The second person you'll see is a Chinese-American, Dr. Charles Lee, who was jailed for three years after he went back to China to try to ex explain the truth of what was happening. He was um, sentenced without anything approaching a fair trial, and uh, and uh, let's take let's and sentenced to a slave labor camp. Let's take a look. Every time they apply the baton on me, I just couldn't help shaking. And uh, and the anticipating of the next round of shocks just was too terrible to, to, to describe. This is exactly what I was forced to make in Nanjing prison. Homer Simpson slippers. I saw this label in, inside the prison when I was making it. SG Footwear Hackensack, New Jersey. When I was in America, I, I watched a uh, you know, Homer Simpson shows, you know, pretty often during the 90s, you know, very funny. But when I was forced to make these shoes in prison, you don't feel as funny at all. The government of China was not prepared to acknowledge that their organs for transplants were coming from prisoners of conscience. But their acknowledgement that the organs were coming from prisoners sentenced to death and then executed was bad enough. That admission met with global revulsion. The Chinese transplant profession was ostracized, on different occasions denied training, uh, abroad publication of papers, uh, exchanges, and presentation platforms at international congresses of their colleagues. Chinese health officials reacted by saying that, as of January this year, they had ceased sourcing organs from prisoners and were now sourcing organs entirely from donors. China created both an organ donor registry and an organ donor distribution system. The government enacted a policy giving priority to local patients and a law forbidding sourcing of organs without consent. Are these changes real or just pretense? The answer is a bit of both. Officials in China have said that prisoners can donate organs still. If that is so, then organ sourcing from prisoners continues. There has been no abatement in the demonization or persecution of Falun Gong. Those remain in full force. As well, even blood testing of Falun Gong practitioners continues. Official statements do not consistently say organ sourcing from prisoners has ended. Some say only that it will end and that China is now in a transition period leading to its ending. There are in reality two systems running in China now, a donation system and a non-donation system. Some hospitals still carry on as they always did, albeit less blatantly than before. The question we ask to China remains, from where do you get your organs for transplants? Chinese officials say now that all is good, but the records are not open to independent scrutiny. International standards do not require that we establish that China is doing something wrong in organ sourcing. International standards rather impose a duty on China to explain where it gets its organs for transplants. That duty is not met just by bold assertions by Chinese authorities that everything is all right. It is met by transparency, accountability, and openness to scrutiny. We say to China, don't just tell us where you get your organs for transplants, show us. Over the past 10 years, the evidence has become overwhelming. We have 32 kinds of evidence that it's happening in China. A surgeon, Enver Toti, has testified that he was forced to remove the organs from a live Uyghur political prisoner in the mid-90s. Organ pillaging most likely then moved to the uh, 
the Tibetans, then to the Uyghurs, and finally to the House Christians, and then massively to the Falun Gong community. In 2013, the EU Parliament, to its credit, passed a resolution where it, quote, expresses its deep concern over the persistent and credible reports of systematic state-sanctioned organ harvesting from large numbers of Falun Gong practitioners. In 2014, Ethan Gutman published a book, The Slaughter, where he interviewed over 100 people and collected new evidence over eight years. He estimates that at any given time, between 450,000 to a million Falun Gong practitioners are languishing in prisons and slave labor camps. He concludes that approximately 65,000 Falun Gong practitioners and two to 4,000 Uyghurs, Tibetans, and Christians were killed for their organs in the 2000 to 2008 period. His uh, estimates regarding Falun Gong practitioners are similar to the ones that David Matus and I have come up, calculated. When you follow the money, you, par you partly begin to understand why this is happening. Hospitals, as the, as the shows, can get 62,000 for kidneys, and hearts work worse up to 160,000. We're talking about billions of dollars in profits. So while the main street media has paid minimal attention to these atrocities, the truth is gradually getting out. We want to show you in this final clip, it's an excerpt from the documentary Human Harvest, which won the prestigious Peabody Award earlier this year. The least the EU can do to stop it is to condemn publicly organ transplantation abuses in China and to inform those European citizens who travel to China for organ transplants. This is a crime against humanity. We should do our best to identify those specific individuals who are engaged in this and put them on the list of people who deserve to be brought to justice. America must stand with the Falun Gong and indeed with all of the oppressed. Beijing must release Falun Gong practitioners and other prisoners of conscience immediately. Today's theme is hidden treasures. I think that the hidden treasure in all of us is the courage to overcome our fears and to stand for what's right no matter what the cost. David and I are just two Davids, and the Goliath we face, as you know, is so huge and is indeed a daunting challenge. This is where we need your help. There are at least three things that all of you can do. First, simply Google organ harvesting in China. Second, tell friends what you've learned. Third, please share this information on Facebook and other social media. Today's internet-connected world, I believe the key is awareness, and fundamentally, we all deserve to be free and that we all are truly connected. If we can reach millions through the power of communities such as TED, we can hopefully inspire enough people to take action, to save, save lives, and to stop this trafficking in human organs. And to, which, of course, is also a crime against humanity. Thank you. <laughs>